Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator for our next panel, architecture critic at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Inga Safran. How's it been so far? Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Introduce Bob Byrne, part two. Thank you. Thank you. Can we get to answer your question while we're waiting? Sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer questions. I'll make jokes. <laughs> uh, for some reason, I've been thinking I want to see Falling Glory. Uh huh. Out of Pittsburgh. Have you been there? I've been there. Yes. Uh, the about? question is about falling water in Pittsburgh. This will be a gentrification panel, but first we'll talk about falling water. Um, I was thinking of putting together a class trip, getting a bunch of people together, getting a bus. What do you think of the idea? I, I think it's a great idea. Do you have any interest in talking about it? Or um, I don't. I don't know. Somebody who would be a good person to say. It. Yeah. Um, I think you should definitely take your class there, and um, but I'm sh there's a lot of great people there at Falling Water who can who can um, probably uh, give a better history of it than, than I can. Um, so I'll just say that. Um, so this is a, a panel on gentrification, and um, a, as I said, I'm Inga Saffron, and um, I, r I write the Changing Skyline column for the Inquirer and for Philly.com. And you, you cannot write about the changing city in Philadelphia right now without writing about gentrification. And, and we have a really great panel of people who, who are in the trenches dealing with this um, day in and day out. And I think it'll be a really uh, interesting conversation. Um, and uh, is it, I was wondering if there is anyone here who has any uh, specific interest in that subject. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> great, great. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. Invisible hands. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So, what question should I ask them? Let's talk about how government process influences eminent domain. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a... That, Using P-H-A, yeah. you all, the worst agency in the city. Wow! Mm -hmm. Let's talk. Okay, okay, great. Thank, thank you for that. Okay, so, so let's get started. Um, so, um, I said we had a great panel, people who are really in the trenches on this subject, and um, immediate to my le left is uh, Jay McCalla, who has uh, worked extensively in city government and was a deputy managing director during the Rendell administration. He's now a public affairs consultant, writer, and contributor to Philly Mag's Citified blog. And we have Beth McConnell, who is the policy director at the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations, uh, which is an umbrella organization for the city's uh, CDCs. And she's here because she recently authored a very thoughtful and comprehensive report on equitable development called Beyond Gentrification, which is definitely required reading for anyone interested in that subject. And we're also honored to have uh, Calvin Gladney, who is uh, Brooklyn born, but now working in DC. Um, as the managing partner of Mosaic Partners, a development group. And he served as an advisor to mayors uh, in Detroit and Oakland. He was the VP at the Anacostia Waterfront Development Corporation, which um, has accomplished amazing things uh, that Philadelphia should try to emulate. Um, we wanted to have Calvin here today because um, in his work with Mosaic, um, He's pioneered partnerships with nonprofits to create mixed use, mixed income projects that incorporate affordable housing and are sensitive to their neighborhoods uh, where they're going up. So um, 
I'm going to start with a big philosophical question uh, related to gentrification. Uh, it's possible I might not get to ask a second question because I know <laughs> once they start talking, it's going to be tough to stop them. Um, but um, I hope not. I'll try to uh, get one or two in. So uh, for a long time, uh, Philadelphia has been using uh, pop-up parks and other kinds of tactical urbanism uh, to bring amenities to, to underserved, uh, under the radar neighborhoods and to get developers thinking about investing in them. But this summer, we saw two cases where uh, private developers were using the very same uh, techniques um, to soften up neighborhoods uh, for their own projects. And there was a strong backlash with accusations of stealth gentrification. We also heard um, uh, in Philadelphia uh, more resentment about bike lanes, dog parks, uh, and other millennial friendly initiatives from people who are worried that their neighborhoods are becoming unaffordable. And so this has gotten me thinking, um, is there a disconnect between um, these urbanist goals that we've been championing for so long and equity? Um, and since it's hard to imagine not wanting to improve uh, neighborhood amenities, how can we have both? So um, Beth, I thought I would start with you um, because of your work with the CDCs. And, and what was your take on the backlash this summer? Well, I think when um, people who have been in our city and in our neighborhoods that have been disinvested in for decades and generations um, suddenly start to see changes that they weren't part of and weren't for them, they get defensive because they feel like they're about to be pushed out. Um, and they have reason to be concerned. And I think the number one lesson that we can learn from these examples is that people need to be involved in decision making about what shapes their neighborhoods. Um, they need to feel that those changes will actually lead to less income inequality, uh, more opportunity, and healthier neighborhoods for them as well as the newcomers. It's not an either or proposition. It needs to be both. Calvin, you, th this very same um, phenomenon has happened in DC. And you were talking about a, a, a case where a, a church is suing the city over a bike lane. Um, can you this talk about that? Can you can you talk about that? And can you talk about how 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 right. to, how has it been resolved, and how have you communicated um, to people that you're working with that um, it's okay? This change can be managed. And um, well, I think part of the challenge is the conversation about gentrification tends to be about only residents, mm -hmm. but it does affect businesses and institutions like churches. And so the same issues that sort of the proverbial older black woman who's being moved out of her house by a younger, whiter, higher educated new person. That story also applies to small businesses and now to churches. So in DC, this uh, particular black church um, sued. Uh, well, they're not suing. They just sent a letter by a, a major law firm. You know. <laughs> sort of like put your gun on the table and then don't. Um, with the idea being that this bike lane was going to run right in front of their church and their senior black parishioners would not be able to sort of drive in because most of them live in the suburbs actually, but that's a different story, uh, and park right in front of the church and go in. So part of their argument, and I don't know if there's any lawyers in the room, uh, they said, well, this was a, a violation of their equal protection right under the law, and this was illustrative of a, a citywide fight against black churches around the city and to get the historic black church out of the DC area. Um, I think what, the, what needs to happen in the conversation is one, you talked about a deficit of process. I also think there's a deficit of facts. So part of it is the black church parishioners are saying, well, black folks don't ride bikes, so these bike lanes are not for us. Um, you know, dog parks. Uh, well, these, you know, you go to the dog park and there's the guys with the beards and plaid shirts and none of those guys are us. Um, but some of that is just not true. It's just not factually true, um, partially because they just don't happen to know the folks who are riding bikes or have the dogs that are using the dog parks. But secondly, some of those is a, it's sort of a chicken and an egg, right? If you put you know, protected bike lanes, as an example, into a neighborhood, more people will use them, including maybe lower income African Americans who don't have other means of transportation. So some of it is there just needs to be a conversation about facts as well as this question of process. Yeah, I, I also, just to go back to you again, um, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about in your work as a developer, 
um, you know, you're in some ways, you know, moving this gentrification process forward. So how you just said I'm part of the problem. Uh, no, I did not say that. How, That's how, what I heard. How, how, how it kind of sounded like that, right? Um, so um, what are what are some of the um, techniques um, that you use or um, to mitigate? What, what those, you know, these very big disruptive changes that are, are really hard for people to, to um, absorb. I think there's a song, it's like, change gonna come, <laughs> right? Um, part of it is conversation as to what your intent is and, and what you're trying to do uh, in the sense of how it benefits the neighborhood. So a perfect example, we're a co-developer in a restaurant. Anybody here been watching in DC, by the way? Um, a little small French bistro called Shea Billy. Anybody been to Shea Billy? Nice. Um, in any event, Shea Billy is a French restaurant. We actually partnered with uh, one of the Hilton brothers from Thievery Corporation and another developer, uh, actually on two city-owned properties, and took these city-owned storefronts and gutted them and put a restaurant in. And it's a French bistro, so obviously the price point of the restaurant was different. Uh, the neighborhood is Petworth, if you no DC. Um, and so the price point, the idea was a French bistro. It's clearly potentially illustrative of not for us. Um, but part of the conversation was, well, this is also creating a gathering place that anybody could come to. And one of the things that happened was it became a gathering place for younger parents. Now, you don't think French bistro younger parents, but we have a back patio. And that back patio is enclosed. And so your little three-year-old can just run around safely and the parents can still drink. And so it, so it provided um, you know, a particular sort of neighborhood amenity that we were able to discuss. And I think a lot of it is developers being able to translate from their sort of market-based idea of what they're doing into things that talk to what the neighborhood needs. Just to add to that, I mean, the business of community development is to reinvest in neighborhoods that have been disinvested for a long time, make them nice, attractive places so that other people will also want to come there, as well as improve it for the folks that are there. So this is a challenge that CDCs have been facing for a really long time. But I think what we try to do that's different than what a market rate developer would do is bake in um, services for the people that are in the neighborhood, um, uh, affordable rental units or homeownership units. Uh, uh, for folks who are income restricted buyers. Um, uh, uh, commercial space for small businesses, uh, potentially rents that are affordable or reduced cost. Mm -hmm. you know, so the kinds of amenities that will help the folks in those neighborhoods also experience and be able to stay and enjoy the changes that are coming. This is a great point to, to turn things to, to Jay. Uh, because you wrote a very provocative article about affordable housing. Um, and in which you said that you know, government cannot do it as efficiently um, as private enterprise, and you, you are basically very down on um, government-supported su affordable housing. Um, yeah. But can you can you expand on that? Well, for every affordable unit that is created by city government, we lose between eighty and one hundred thousand dollars. That's not sustainable, and we will build two or three hundred units in a city where there are say one hundred thousand on the waiting list in PHA. That's a measure of uh, the people who need housing. I mean, you can argue about the number, but that's the recorded number. And you can use that as an in, a vague indication as to the need. Um, of course, there are more people doubled up in housing, people living with family. But when we build 300 units, that doesn't make a dent. Uh, when we lose 80 to $100,000 on those units for every one we build, that makes it enormously vulnerable to angry politics. It's just not sustainable. And uh, if I can just talk a little mm -hmm. bit about gentrification mm -hmm. uh, generally. I think there are, we need to define what gentrification is, though all of us have a sense of what it is. To the gentrifier, there is an optimism. There is an aspiration. They're coming in uh, as young couples to buy economically and invest and watch their values improve. To the renter in that neighborhood, he or she knows that they're going to lose their apartment and they're going to have to move because of the upward pressure on prices, on rentals. The landlord will sell or the landlord, landlord will jack up the rents. The problem, and I, I think Calvin's example of the church folk gets to it, the older long-term residents of a neighborhood, um, there's the increase in taxes, but City Hall in Philadelphia has a few clever ways to assuage the pain of increased taxes, feeding them in slower, 
uh, phasing them in when the, the property is turned over. So the taxes isn't really the problem either, though people will focus on it. At the core of it, and the, the, the bike lanes are, are symptoms of these things, is cultural affinity. Everybody buys a home based on cultural affinity. It's the same way we vote. That's how we get Chinatown. That's how we get Italian neighborhoods. They move in where they feel comfortable culturally. And when they see that, that, cult, that, that comfort threatened, then they react and they start pointing out at, at things that are really silly, bike lanes, uh, jogging paths, dog parks. These are all things that are good. Everybody wants their neighborhood to improve. But I think government does a very, very, very bad job of identifying the people who are long-term residents with investments, who are the luckiest ducks on the planet, but we don't know how to show them that. They buy a house for $25,000 30 years ago, and now it's worth 200. They are the luckiest ducks in the world. But somebody needs to show them uh, and gives them some modest instruction on financial literacy. You now have $200,000 in equity, Here's how you can take out an awful lot of that. Take that trip to Europe or to Africa or South America that you've always wanted. Take that favorite niece of yours and send her to her uh, the community college for free as your gift. I see. I see. I see. Is this the heated, heated debate <laughs> part of the panel? Okay. Well, but but but, but no, 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 yeah, we, we, we got, yeah. We got, we got yeah. some responses. But we there. can do this. Be be be. In defense of the people who react. Um, there's no question that economic inequality in this city is absolutely unacceptable. There's no question that people live in neighborhoods where the, the roof is caving in, they can't afford to turn the heat on, and across the street a $700,000 home is being built with a 10-year property tax abatement. We have to do something about this incredible inequality. We have to do something about our neighborhoods that are disinvested in. And I don't think the answer to gentrification is less investment. investment. It is more investment in the people and the places that the private market it ignores and leaves behind. Okay. And, yeah, <laughs> Jay and I didn't get to talk about this before, uh, before so I'm going to disagree with two things you said. Okay. <laughs> One is I, I wholeheartedly don't believe that the people moving into neighborhoods are moving in for cultural affinity. Most people are making decisions on what they can afford, maybe uh, access to transit, but they're not saying, particularly if you want to say the new Philadelphians, are not saying, I'm moving to this neighborhood because of a cultural affinity. No, that's fact, not what I said, saying, but go ahead. Uh, well, okay. Well, if that's not what you said. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, the second point is I actually disagree that the market overall is better at it. I mean, one of the things I like to say is we, we tend to have this fight and this conversation about gentrification, and the problem is, is when we're having the fight, the train has already left the station. And if uh, I think the government has a great role that they just don't play well, which is during the planning and the strategy process, all of this stuff has been planned out in public, the revitalization strategy, the transfer of properties, land banking and the like, all of that was done years before the new residents move into the neighborhood. And it's during that planning process that we can do some of the things that you talked about nonprofits should do, but as an example, in DC's Columbia Heights, uh, when the city, and I worked for the National Capital Revitalization Corporation at the time, they owned 10 parcels in an area. So as opposed to doing a disposition where we just sold them all to the highest bidder, we allocated some of them to affordable housing. And we said, from an urban design standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, they will look indistinguishable from the other buildings. And if you go to Columbia Heights now, you couldn't look at one and say, that's the affordable. We also put public realm sort of community, there's a community spring fountain right in the middle of the neighborhood. That could have easily been just another condo or, or market rate building. So I, I do think the government has a great role in producing affordable housing. I think the difference is the market is the execution partner. The public sector needs to set the policy and the infrastructure and then let the market does what it does. But the, when it comes to uh when I've been to the people who are moving in, I, I, I said that they were the aspirational ones, the ones willing to invest. And I do very much agree that the government has a very strong role to play. But when it comes to the creation of affordable housing, we have got to put our shoulder to the wheel to bring down the cost of it. Because we can't do it on the scale that it's required. We just can't. If we're, again, losing eighty dollars to $100,000, and most people don't know that we subsidize it so lavishly. There are great models, and maybe Inga is familiar, uh, and this may sound a wee bit off the wall, but I gave this to a mayoral candidate who was going to pitch it had he gotten elected, but he didn't. Uh, that, uh, what do they call them, cargo 
containers. Shipping containers. Shipping, oh. yeah. I mean, okay, now that, that doesn't <laughs> ring. But that's a visceral reaction to an idea that needs to be explored, but because of the visceral reaction, uh, we're missing great opportunities to provide uh, affordable housing in the 20s and the $30,000 per unit. That if you go online today, before you've got smartphones with you, go search shipping containers for housing. Oh, I got to you, you will be, no, I mean, there's nothing to disagree on. They can find that for themselves. Go, go Google that, and you'll see that they're inexpensive and they can be attractive. Beth, tell, tell Mark us what's wrong moment in time, because I'm going to agree with Jay McCalla on something, which is that the cost But we love each other. <laughs> the cost of constructing new affordable housing in Philadelphia is outrageous, mm -hmm. and we need to do something to bring those costs down. That doesn't mean we need to stop building new affordable housing. We need to address that cost. And, right. does, that sure. and does that involve addressing unions? It, it involves all players at the table mm -hmm. um, and figuring out a solution. But I also want to say we also have uh, roughly 38,000 vacant properties uh, throughout Philadelphia, many of which are vacant lots, some of which should be green space and some of which should be side yards, but some of which we need to build things on. And the other point that I think is really important that we haven't talked yet about yet is the um, incredible amount that we are underfunding um, home repair and rehabilitation mm -hmm. programs. Yeah, let's talk about that because, um, you know, can you get um, – I don't know if everyone knows what, what these home repair grants are, but there are programs in Philadelphia so what, you know, to keep people from being forced out of their home because their roof collapsed, they might need a small grant to, to, to repair it, and then they can stay in their house and they can gain equity and stay in the neighborhood as it changes. But I was wondering, can those kind of programs really be done at the scale uh, in the quantities that we need? They must. Mm -hmm. um, we have a significant, uh, uh, you know, Philadelphia is a very old city. We have a, uh, an aging housing stock. Um, we have um, a, a number of people who have paid off their mortgage um, or they have inherited their home from a grandparent, so have no mortgage, but are, are significantly poor and can't afford the basic repairs. If they are displaced from those homes, we need to build them new housing that's too expensive. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out a way to repair those homes. And I think one model of equitable development is when you have new construction and new development in a neighborhood, and it might be private market rate development, is figuring out a way for that developer to have a channel to invest in the houses across the street where the roofs are caving in. Help improve those properties, it's good for the developer because then the value of what they're trying to sell goes up if the neighborhood is nicer and allows the folks across the street to kind of stay and benefit from the new changes in their neighborhood. Uh, that's just one example. There are plenty of neighborhoods that are not gentrifying in Philadelphia that are facing really significant problems of this sort. Um, and I think we've got to look at all kinds of tools, grants, tapping equity in people's homes, uh, loans for people that don't have equity but probably could afford to pay a few bucks a month but can't get a bank loan or a home equity loan. We need to look at all of these options to really attack that problem. Can That's I make a, one yeah. addendum to that? Um, I mean, I think a lot of this discussion has been about the supply side. Oh, let's get the cost of affordable housing down. Let's create, let's use new models of storage containers, um, different ways to get more affordable housing. But I, I think we need to have a two-sided discussion because the market always wins. The market always wins. So we are never going to, I mean, at some point, the cost to build a home, whether it's a multifamily affordable building or a single-family affordable home, has an inherent cost to it. So we're still only talking increments we can, we can bring down some of the costs. We can use some models, but you know, a lot of people argue that you can't scale storage can container communities in any way that's going to really make a dent on the problem. Some of it needs to deal with the demand side, which is really working on workforce development so that folks have the incomes, that it's not just the question of whether there's affordable housing, but folks have a path to middle class or at least working class incomes, so therefore they can pay a bit more. There's only so much you can do in terms of the physical housing stock and how much it costs to build a box. I mean, we're building boxes and then we're putting prettier things inside and outside, C but the box has yeah, a cost. Certainly, um, a lot of people um, have argued, and, and uh, John, John Geeting, a blogger in Philadelphia, has written that Philadelphia doesn't have an affordable housing problem, it has um, a jobs problem. But, okay. Jay, yeah, it, where, how, how are we going to solve that? Well, I don't, know we, how you solve, I don't know how you solve the jobs problem. That's, that's, it took decades to get into this. I think when you talk about lower income people, you've got neighborhoods where you've got uh, structurally unemployed. By that, I mean people who are ex-offenders and 
the large institutions in the city, the universities and the utility companies and the hospitals, illegally discriminate against employing them. If you've gone to jail to be an embezzler, no, you can't be hired as a bookkeeper, but you can certainly be a driver, you can certainly be an office worker, et cetera. So I think if we get reduce or eliminate some of the illegal discrimination against ex-offenders, that would help. But in terms of creating more housing and matching the supply to the demand, we used to have a great program in this city called the Philadelphia Urban Homestead Program. It was where a uh, family, they, the city would identify an abandoned property, fix it up, put some modest investment into it. The homeowner would assume 50% of the responsibility for the cost of the rehab, and the city would assume 50, the other 50%. So you're putting where did the fifty percent of the homeowner? Where did that money come from? Well, you're talking about many people who are working. You've got two, maybe two people making fifteen thousand dollars a year, so that's thirty thousand. Um, you get some savings. They're not destitute. They're poor, uh, working poor. But you know, there's no down payment. But this was a way to put people who need better housing into safe, secure, modernized housing, and at the same time reduce our our. Uh, almost an uncountable number of abandoned houses in this city because any government agency that tells you they know how many abandoned houses there are in Philly is not being candid. We don't know. Uh, we typically have had 1,000 a year become vacant. Those are old numbers. There are no current numbers. You'd be amazed what government doesn't know about the problem. But we can go back and revisit that model, which reduces our, our, our instead of spending the money to demolish, identify them, and what just is too expensive to rehab, then, then we demolish. Uh, but uh, demolition is, a, is the ultimate solution to what's oftentimes a, a solvable problem. Uh, before, before we, we only have a few minutes left, so I, I wanted to mention a, a very recent report by the Philadelphia Fed on, on gentrification. And uh, Beth was saying earlier, it was one of the first reports to quantify the problem. Like we really don't know, you know how big is this problem, how many houses do we need, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk about that report? Sure. And it, was, it also talked about displacement, and, and I guess uh, you know, a simplified version of its conclusion is that uh, the displacement issue is a little overrated. I would uh, maybe summarize a little bit differently. It was one of the there's been a lot of studies about gentrification, but this is one of the first that actually looked at real people mm -hmm. and how they move by looking at their credit scores and their credit reports wa rather than kind of other proxy mm -hmm. data for trying to figure out figure it out. And it looks specifically at displacement mm -hmm. and it looks specifically at Philadelphia and Philadelphia's uh, gentrifying neighborhoods. And what they found were that uh, people who have low credit scores who are more likely to be poor. Um, they move a lot anyway. They're moving constantly. So there's not a lot of evidence that they're moving more often out of gentrifying neighborhoods, um, but they're not moving into gentrifying neighborhoods. So they're not getting access to the improved conditions and the benefits. And when they do move, they move to poorer quality neighborhoods with, with worse schools, um, higher crime, and lack of other kinds of amenities. Um, so we're seeing a kind of, I think, a slow shift, a slow displacement from that study of uh, folks who, who are moving out and folks are not moving in um, unless they're higher credit score and higher income. What I think that tells us, and I want to come back to a really important point that, um, that you made earlier, is um, that the train has not left the station yet in Philadelphia in many of our neighborhoods. Maybe in some, but not in others. In Point Breeze, which has been ground zero for gentrification uh, discussions, we have a lot of vacant property. We have tax delinquent property in private, uh, vacant tax delinquent property in private hands that the land bank can acquire. We can build in affordable housing for low income folks now while the neighborhood is improving and create mixed income communities of opportunity. Um, we can do that in a lot of our neighborhoods where these changes are happening, and we must, and I really hope the next mayor makes that a priority. Yep, Kelvin, I know you, you want to respond to that. Or I, I, I saw you shaking your head. Uh, the, the only other thing I would say is we need to do the same thing for small businesses, Absolutely. and some of that has to be about training and really, again, if the train hasn't left the station, we know what neighborhoods have commercial corridors where right now there's, you know, I always like to say, can Larry's Liquors turn to Wally's Wine Shop, right? But that process, right? Um, anybody know Larry's Liquors, by the way? Um, that process requires a certain level of training and understanding, okay, your customer profile is changing. Okay, that doesn't mean that you can no longer serve the local neighborhood residents that have been there, but you maybe need to add some products, and maybe you need to use the city's facade 
grant program in order to fix up your facade, and maybe you take away the plastic spinning, you know, bulletproof glass, but somebody needs to teach them about those things and help them do the investments and the changes that will help them be in place when things happen. A great example of that is Ben's Chili Bowl in DC. Anybody's been to Ben's Chili Bowl? Um, so Ben's U Street Corridor hyper gentrification, right? It's like, you know, you look up gentrification in Wikipedia and it's like, U Street. Um, and what Ben's Chili Bowl did, number one, very important, they bought their own building. So all of this rising rents, we get kicked out, we own this, so we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, so Ben's Chili Bowl, they have half smokes. In DC, it's like a kind of pork sausage kind of thingy. Um, they added turkey dogs and turkey burgers. And they got a little friendlier in their customer service. Uh, and they kept the authenticity of a sort of old school diner, but cleaned it up a little bit. And so they made the changes to be ready for when these forces of gentrification happen, they were ready. So those are the type of things we need to teach our small businesses and not just our residents. J Jay, we, we just have a, few, a minute left, so I'll, I'll let you, uh, do you think that, do you agree with that? Very much. I think that there's a way to, that people can become friendly. Everybody, again, the basic premise is that everybody wants their neighborhood to improve. There's a way to do it. Now, Ben Chile had been rigid and resentful of the new influx of people with money in their pocket, uh, but they weren't. They were enlightened, they were embracing, and they saw the upside, which flips back to my other comment, my earlier comment, that we have to show the older long-term homeowners in neighborhoods that are being gentrified how to tap into that money, how to tap into that equity, and still leave enough equity for uh, generational wealth to be passed on to their kids. By we can, way, we can do this and, and we can do it well. I don't want them on a macro scale sending their kids on European vacations. Well, um, that's, that would be as, big government as, to as tell as them a, no. As a yeah. use of their equity that yeah. they're getting, yeah. I would say yeah. let's on a macro level get to stay in place, use that equity to buy the houses next to you, and so now you're trying to attack the structural problem rather than have an individual or, upside. Or we can make them let their own, make their own decisions. We could, but I'm just we telling could. you what yes, I would advise. We actually could. If we want to make a, a macro level. Yeah. Uh, Government could really be novel and let them make their own decisions. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. All right, yeah. I think on that we should take this outside. Okay, <laughs> take this outside. <laughs> All right. Calvin. Okay. Awesome.